asked if we could have the students come in and uh, that we'll be collecting your question cards. That would be great. Well, welcome everyone to a congressional candidate candidate forum featuring these candidates who are running for Congressional District 7. I'm Paula Lee. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Sacramento County, and I'll be the moderator tonight. A little commercial about the League, if you don't mind. We are a nonpartisan organization, and we're also a political organization of women and men. We work at all levels of government, the national, state, and local level, to encourage informed and active participation in government. The League does not support or oppose political candidates or parties. Although we do not endorse or oppose candidates, we very definitely are a political organization. And we do, after careful study, take positions on ballot measures and legislation at the state capitol with our advocacy arm. Tonight is an educational event, so we do education and advocacy. You can find our positions on our website. And also, we invite you to join the League of Women Voters, men and women. You can find us online, or you can pick up a membership brochure out in front to learn more about us. The format for tonight will be as follows. Each candidate is going to make a one to two minute opening statement. That would be something to listen carefully to and it might generate a question. And you have a card for that. Next, the candidates will respond to your written questions. And as you saw in the program, we ask that all your questions be directed to all the candidates. They'll all have an opportunity to answer, so don't write your question to one person. If you have a question and a card needs to be picked up, students will be right there as I see the one, <laughs> ready to go, to pick up your card and bring it to the question sorters right here. Write as clearly as possible, please, for me. You don't need to sign it or say who you are. We hope you will stick to the issues, and all candidates will have an opportunity to answer the questions. Then when you've written your question, you can raise your hand and someone will pick it up. And if you need another card, raise your hand again, and someone will bring you another card. Please hold in the applause. I know it's pretty exciting when you have your candidates sitting up here, but please hold in the applause until the end. That's just in fairness to all the candidates. And we ask, and I think you've all complied very nicely, that campaign materials and campaigning be done outside the room. Plenty of campaigning and talk can be done when you're outside this room. And this really conforms to our policies for a fair and unbiased forum. So the candidates will have one to two minutes, one and a half minutes to respond to each question, and then finally they'll have one minute to make a closing statement. For the benefit of the candidates, the timer, Manaz Kasari, is right there in front. She'll provide that 30 second sign that she just held up so you can begin to pull your thoughts together to a close and then she'll have the ever present stop sign. When you see the stop sign, feel free, as I said, to finish your sentence. No campaign. Yeah. No. No, no. We won't display it. It's okay. not. It's according to the policies yeah. of the League of Women Voters, it's not allowed in here. You know, okay. if, you, if you hold them and you don't display them, yeah. it's fine. We're fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll know if they display them. <laughs> don't want to kick you out. <laughs> no. But you understand that's just in fairness to everyone. So thank you very much for respecting that. Now, to avoid a very embarrassing moment, 
everyone in the room right now, and they want to take this opportunity to turn off the ringer on your cell phone. It would be very much appreciated. Now, the candidates running for District 7, the congressional seat held currently by Ani Vera, are Jeff Burdock, Democrat, John Ivey, Republican, Buzz Patterson, Republican, and Chris Richardson, Green Party. The incumbent, Ami Berra, could not be here. We tried to have it work out where he was uh, in the district at the time this facility was available, but it just wasn't working. So we have, hope to have him back for the general election. I'll be rotating who answers the questions. You'll see how that works and all candidates will have the opportunity to answer the questions. So welcome candidates, and thank you for agreeing to participate. You've agreed to stick to the issues that we talked about, and to yourself rather than reflecting on others in the race, and we find that voters and moderators prefer that. <laughs> so we will begin with an opening statement from Jeff Burdock. Well, first of all, thanks a lot to the League of Women's Voters for holding this. Uh, they're great stewards of our democracy, and we need that uh, more than ever. Um, again, I'm Jeff Burdick, and I'm 49. I'm a husband and father who lives in Arden Arcade. Uh, I am a former newspaper and magazine journalist who's also worked in state and local governments, including presently for Caltrans. I've also worked previously in D.C. and on two congressional campaigns. One of those campaigns was successful, and the other one, not quite as successful. <laughs> um, normally, I'm a person who's been behind the scenes, but that changed this time around when I realized that our incumbent has never been primaried by a fellow Democrat. And uh, I have solidly Democratic positions on some critical issues that he does not represent um, back in D.C. So I decided this time around that I would put my knowledge of government, policy, and campaigns to work for this district. Now, I did so by making two crucial commitments. One, I would run on a, uh, on a progressive platform that includes uh, Medicare for All, comprehensive drug cost uh, reform, and the Green New Deal. Uh, this is this, uh, it was not hard to make this decision because our district is now solidly democratic, and most Democrats and even independents agree with me on these same positions. My second thing that I decided to make sure as part of my campaign was taking the most principled uh, fundraising pledge in the nation. I'm not going to let my, uh, my uh, desire to win erode any of my principles. And this principle involves me not taking any money from PACs or corporations, but also from only voters in this district. And the reason for this is I want to maximize your voice and influence once I'm in D.C. So uh, I appreciate your consideration for me as your next representative in Congress. And with your support in the primary, I'll be ready for the next marathon, which will be in November after the primary. John Ivey. Hi everybody, my name is John Ivey. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, or they, them. Either one works for me. I'm 33 years old. I am an Air Force veteran. I enlisted and served for five years. Uh, they taught me Chinese Mandarin, which is pretty cool. Um, for the last five years, I've been working in elections management and uh, voting rights. Uh, I'm a voting rights advocate for the Voter Access Project. Um, before the Air Force, I did a bunch of different jobs. I was a dishwasher, a deli clerk. Uh, I did tax preparation. I was a sales manager. I was a truck unloader for Walmart, which was my favorite job of all time. Uh, you just, you take the boxes from inside of the truck and you put them inside the store. It was simple, it was straightforward, and very little in life is that simple and straightforward. Um, we are sitting right now on stolen land. Um, I believe this was the belonging to the Milwaukee tribe um, before they were forcibly removed. And I bring that up because I think history is important. Um, it's important to know where you're from. It's important to know where you are. And right now we are in a country 
that is facing huge systemic problems. And we need to come up with solutions. Income and wealth inequality is higher now than it's ever been before. We have billionaires here in California living in the same zip code where people are dying on the streets. People are dying on the streets. People are dying on the streets. I'm a progressive Republican, which is a thing that hasn't been heard of in 50 or 100 years. I like to think of President Lincoln, Grant, Teddy Roosevelt, Eisenhower. And I want to build a, a party that can take on the establishment. I want to bring back that progressive spirit. And I want to take on the corporate Democrats who long ago sold out. They sold us all out. And so thank you for your time. And I look forward to hearing your questions. After the event, I'm sure all of us will, will want to hear from you as well. Thank you. Buzz Patterson. Hey, I'm Buzz Patterson. I'm a retired Air Force pilot and officer. I flew in the Air Force for 20 years uh, to include duty in 69 countries across the world, six continents. In 1995, I was asked by the White House, the, the Clinton White House, to come be President Bill Clinton's senior military aide and carry the nuclear football, which is the large black, black satchel that accompanies the president no matter where he or she is anywhere in the world, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So as that military aide, I, was, I lived with the Clintons for two years. I had an office in the White House and a bedroom in the White House. I retired from um, the Air Force in 2001 to become a commercial airlines pilot. I flew for Delta Airlines for 16 years. Uh, I started to see what was happening in my state, California, and I thought it was time to make a change for California. We are losing so many people. We're moving out of our state. We're losing our tax base. We're losing our, our citizens and moving for a better life in Texas, Nevada, Colorado, and Utah. And I think it's up to us and coming upon us as Californians to either stay and fight, or flee, and I have chosen to stay and fight. I'm also a best-selling author. I've written four books, two New York Times bestsellers. Uh, I am a, a, a conservative Republican. I think I'm probably more conservative than I am as Republican over the years. I am a family man. I've got a wife and three children. All three are in public schools right now, and I've seen what's happening in our state in terms of public schools. And I think it's, uh, to, to have the fifth largest economy in the world, and to have public schools right number 43 to number 48, depending on the study, is a crime and it's abysmal. I agree with John about the homelessness. It's, in fact, homeless vets are, uh, particularly hurt my heart, having served for 20 years and been in Iraq and Afghanistan. The fact that we are not taking care of our young men and women who have served four, five, and six times overseas, and they come home and cannot get jobs. They have, they have problems either mentally or physically, PTSD pr primarily, also with addiction problems and alcoholism. We've got to be doing a better job for our homeless, especially our vets. We can do better, and that's why I'm running for Congress. Thank you very much. Chris Richardson. Thank you. I'd like to thank the legal women voters also for uh, putting on this uh, little soiree. Uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure talking with you all. I uh, I started out actually as a biologist, and I worked for the state of Florida for seven years, and uh, then went into uh, I was putting myself through school, operating computer for banks, and uh, then uh, worked around the the country. Uh, in various uh, capacities. I ended up at uh, the Johnson Space Center working with NASA, uh, single link, and I was started out across the street uh, on F-16 and then uh, was moved over to shuttle uh, for the first three launches. And uh, then I left to work at the National Space Technologies Laboratory in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. And I was then transferred to the Naval Weapons Center in China Lake. That got me out to California. And then I was uh, tapped to uh, help with uh, the Army, Navy, and Air Force hospitals around the world. And we set those up and it, it ended up costing $1.01 billion back in 85. Now, uh, the seed for that was the VA's integrated hospital system. And uh, so what I'm looking to do here is to try and bring this back uh, and help the, uh, the, the homeless. Again, we, I have a number of friends who are homeless and we're trying to, uh, most of the military 
agencies out there have got mobile, uh, you know, um, living facilities that could be utilized. And I want to see that done. Also, there's bachelor, or, bachelor officer quarters that could be reactivated and used. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I failed to mention that we have a, a really exciting thing that, that will um, get me out of this spot for a few minutes. And those of you who know about the Civitas program know that these students start, as we said in the program, and uh, they're in the program for four years. So we're really lucky tonight that we have one of the seniors from the program that is going to address two questions to you, the candidates. So that will be interesting. And I'll call him up here at some point. Okay, first question is going to be for John Ivey. This is very much on the minds of a lot of people in this country, John. And so this voter wants to know, what is your position on a single payer Medicare for all type of healthcare system? Well, I believe that universal health care is a moral imperative. Um, that no one in our country, the richest country in probably the history of the world, um, should get sick and die or get injured and go bankrupt because they are poor. Um, so universal health care is a moral imperative. How do we provide that in the most efficient and fiscally responsible way? Definitely not how we're doing it now. And so what I see as the best option on the table, the bill in Congress, is Medicare for all. And if I'm in Congress and we have a president that, that is fighting for it, I want to help get that done. Uh, if you look at our, our health care system currently, there are four elements to health care in the United States of America. You've got the hospitals, you've got the doctors, you've got the insurance companies, and you've got the patient. Right now, the only part of that uh, group that's not getting taken care of is the patient. Medicare for all would take out the competition that the patient needs to have choices. Uh, it's like going, do you want to have the DMV controlling your health care? Uh, for example, I'm 64 years old. I shouldn't be paying for somebody else's prenatal care. Uh, that should be the person who needs prenatal care or their insurance company. But we have focused, we've taken the focus off the patient in this country, and Medicare for All does that. We give the government control over how uh, to manage our, our health care problems, our health care programs. And that only, that only empowers the government, it only empowers the hospitals and the, and the insurance companies that leaves the patient out of the equation. So I'm opposed to Medicare for All. I think we have to have competition in this country. Uh, if not, we're going to drive the good doctors of technology out of this country if we're saying leaving the, social, the United Kingdom and Canada. So I'm adamantly opposed to Medicare for All. Well, uh, we have monetized health care so badly in this country that we spend two to four times as much as any other country for health care and our outcomes are horrible. They're slightly above Uganda's. We, we kill 30 to 45,000 people a year just in the denial of service because of the, the health insurance industry. We need to get them out of the business. They are a parasite. And the, when you go to the doctor, the doctor should only have to worry about getting you well, not how much coverage you have. And that makes it, you know, and the whole spectrum of health is much wider than what they define just in the hospital. There's nutrition and there's, there's uh, preventative care and, and a lot of things that could be done that will improve health care. And we aren't doing them. We need to do, be doing more proactive health care. And that is involving the patient in directing his own life so that he does what is healthy for himself. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm firmly, firmly on the side of supporting Medicare for All. Uh, I was in favor of Obamacare when it passed, and that was a very good 
first step, an intermediate step. And really the only step left to reach universal care is to make that jump to a single payer plan. And uh, all the studies that have looked at it has shown that Medicare for All will make the system simpler, less expensive, more accessible by covering everyone. Uh, and it is what needs to happen to cover the last 30 million people who don't have access to it. Now, I'm not one of these individuals who says that Medicare for All is going to cure everything. Because it's not. There's aspects of our system, our privatized medical system, that still will need to be addressed. For instance, Medicare for All is not going to solve the issue of rural hospitals having closed. That's going to take separate action by Congress to take care of that. Likewise, when it comes to comprehensive drug cost reform and reining in the cost of medical devices and other services, our system of reining in those costs are only going to be as good as our political system allows it to be. Medicare for All will take a, out a lot of the money from the insurance companies, but you're still going to have those other groups out there that has financial sway over Congress, which is why a big part for me is also to get after comprehensive campaign finance reform, which needs to be by constitutional amendment, or else we're always going to have other corporations doing an end round and not making the savings for Medicare for All as robust as they could be. Okay, first question for Buzz Patterson. And I should mention um, that if you're wondering what these nice women are doing right here, they are sorting the questions. And it's only to avoid redundancy, so we don't ask the same questions, because a lot of times we get some redundancy. And of course, they would uh, leave out any personal attacks. That's all they're doing to help me out. So, uh, Buzz Patterson. Yes. Um, what can the federal government do, or what would you recommend they do to combat the vaping epidemic? Well, <laughs> uh, I, I, I have two schools of thought in terms of vaping. Um, I'm, I've never been a smoker and I don't vape. However, I do think vaping uh, is a, uh, a useful tool for those who are addicted to cigarettes. Um, I think that there needs to be uh, an FDA um, control. I also think that we need to take it out of the hands of, of kids. My kids, I've got an eighth grader and a, and a high school senior. A junior, and probably about half of their classes are filled with kids that vape, and I think that's uh, that's a tragedy, and we're seeing some of the medical uh, fallout from some of that. So I'm not opposed to vaping for adults. I do think it helps people who are addicted to, to nicotine to get off of uh, cigarettes. It's a, I think it's a better alternative, obviously, in terms of lung cancer, those kind of things. Uh, the government should be controlling that. The FDA should take care of that, but we should be getting those things out of the hands of kids until they're at least 18 years old and have the, have the option as an adult to make that decision for themselves. Thank you. Okay. Well, vaping, uh, I think that is a really bad choice. Um, what can we do about it? Well, again, it's another industry that is cued in on destroying people. Uh, before, uh, it was uh, the solvents that are in the, the vaping, it was cadmium dust in the batteries that th they were sucking on that were causing problems in their health. And that's a very tough thing to, to diagnose and it kills, it kills badly. And uh, yeah. Uh, it's just another nicotine delivery system that unfortunately right now is legal and it probably should not be. Uh, but, you know, if we've run into problems with prohibitions before and while it seems like it's a, a personal choice, yeah, it's a personal choice to die, unfortunately. And there are better things to do with your life. Um, I as well am against allowing such easy access for minors to using vaping products. Um, this issue though, you know, I, I, I would allow the uh, 
the CDC and uh, the Federal Trade Commission have a lot more power to control it. Uh, but this goes beyond just vaping, because pretty much most people, it's, what, maybe like 10% or less, are on the other side of the issue. And this gets to one of the fundamental problems with our system, where such a small minority, who mostly have a financial interest in an unhealthy situation, has veto right over an issue, even getting to the floor of Congress. And how do they have that veto issue? It's because they have financial power in terms of donations, lobbying. In the case of vaping, there's not this wellspring of people who are rising up to scare politicians to be on the other side of it. It just comes down to just crass financial donations and politicians who are, who are willing to accept them. And so definitely what we can do to, get to, to make it harder for minors to have access to it is very important. But the underlying issue, kind of like the nicotine issue of, the, of this is in politics, is getting rid of financial, the financial element in our campaign finance system. And to touch on what, what, what everybody's saying, the, it's not a coincidence that the, the leading seller of, of, of vape products, uh, Juul, is actually just Philip Morris. That's, that's not an accident. It's not, oh wow, I wonder why that happened. Um, Philip Morris it not only sells cigarettes and tobacco products here in the United States, they sell it abroad. Their lobbying efforts here pale in comparison to their lobbying efforts in other countries where they, they make sure that there's laws allowing them to, to target minors and to sell to minors. And really we need to look very, I mean, as, as Jeff would tell you, is money in politics is, is a kind of a fundamental issue. It's the reason why we have so many problems is because you're able to buy your way into Congress. You're able to, to buy laws from congressmen. Um, but also we need to, to, to better educate the public about who is buying what laws. And really the, the forces behind vaping are not your, your friends and family who smoke or vape, and it's definitely not the kids that, that are getting hooked. Um, the, the forces are the, really the, the party leaders who refuse to stand up to companies like Philip Morris. And so I, I think it's important that we win elections, that we find people who are willing to fight and we put them in office. Okay, you guys got the routine very well. Good. Very nice. Smart guys. Okay, Good <laughs> Chris, this question is for you. Um, and right on topic. Should Citizens United be overturned? And if you could, uh, for the audience, just maybe do a little brief on Citizens United. Okay, Citizens United is a PAC system that... Uh, What's a PAC? Well, a political action committee that uh, gathers money from various sources and hides those sources so that you're not really sure where the money is coming from. And it's a good way of hiding your, your donations uh, to, to buy uh, favor uh, from other, uh, you know, for other uh, reasons other than the well-being of the, the people. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's something that was cooked up a while back in order to hide how donations were being made. And they have not worked well for the, the people in general. It really has hurt democracy in this country badly. And we, we need to, to be turning them over and making those donations more visible so that we know who it is that's taking our democracy away from us. Yes, uh, well, Citizens United uh, was a, uh, a plaintiff in a case that went to the Supreme Court and was decided in 2010. And that decision by the Supreme Court, uh, a key part of it that allowed for all this dark money to enter our politics, and by dark money, I mean this is 
uh, money that you don't have to report from where the source is. Uh, and the ruling equated um, political donations with free speech, but also allowed this loophole for not disclosing the money, which created super PACs. Now, I'm running in my campaign on a couple key issues related to this. I've taken a, the most principled uh, fundraising pledge in the nation. I'm taking no money from corporations, PACs, and only from voters in this district. And this is a core part of a constitutional amendment that I'm running on. It's a nonpartisan election reform constitutional amendment to address a number of issues, just like Citizens United, that the Supreme Court either is not addressing or is made worse with its rulings. And this would apply my principle of fundraising to all federal campaigns. It would also overturn Citizens United. It would no longer allow equating political donations with free speech. It would end corporate personhood and end gerrymandering. These are things that 80, 90% of all voters believe in. But the only way we can overturn it and change these things is by a constitutional amendment because the Supreme Court has made clear it's not in their domain or they are on the other side of the issue. Yeah, the, the truth is, like Jeff said, the, the Supreme Court that we have now is not going to rethink Citizens United. It's, it's very clear that, that that is going to be precedent for a while, and so uh, a constitutional amendment is needed. But you probably already know that. I know four years ago, uh, Californians voted, uh, I forget the proposition number, but we all, we all said, yes, we would like to overturn Citizens United. Sacramento actually came out ahead of the rest of the, the state saying, yes, we want to overturn Citizens United. Um, I know um, if anybody's familiar with uh, Jan Huger, his group Wolfpack has been going around state to state trying to, to push a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United, and California's legislature has already signed on and is a supporter. And so it's not about convincing the people here that we need to fix this. We need to go out and talk to our neighbors and our cousins and our friends in other states and say, hey, this is a nonpartisan issue. This is something you should care about. Um, we don't want moneyed interests, special interests, dictating how we live our lives. And that's what's happening under Citizens United is the mountain of dark money coming in from wherever. And when you have a Congress whose uh, re-election rate is, you know, an inverse to their popularity, you know that there is a problem. I'm the only person in this room who's got a personal connection to this case because I was in the movie, he'll be the movie, uh, the documentary that was that went to the Supreme Court, David Bossie's movie, all the movie I've seen here several times. So I've got uh, some interesting takes on this. Uh, I agree with the dark movie, I mean the dark money. I agree that super PAC should be outlawed, but it should be outlawed across the board. When we have George Soros pumping, pumping in money to his, to his Open Societies Institute, when you got the Koch brothers doing the exact same thing from the right, you've got super PAC money and it's all dark. So I would not be opposed to, to uh, making super PACs illegal, but you cannot hold Citizens United as the albatross uh, and, and point the finger just at them. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamental problem in Washington, D.C. Our process is broken. We're too reliant on money in politics. So if we're going to talk about Citizens United, let's talk about PAC money, big PAC money across the board. I'm, I'm totally open to that, but let's not make, let's not make Citizens United the end-all, be-all to what's wrong with Washington, D.C. And, and dark money, because it's it's very, very deep, and it goes, it's, it's international as well. It's not just Washington, D.C. Okay, and now I'd like to invite Sam back up to ask the questions, and he'll direct his first question to you, Jeff, and his second question to John Ivey. Hi, I'm Sam Nick. I'm a state of student, a senior at Ray Mercado High School. And my first question is with uh, new congressmen, congresswomen, young men and women, they are pushing more a progressive economic economic uh, ideal, economic policy into our Congress, into our floors. How will that kind of policy affect your how you want to implement policy when you're in office? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, well, I'm running on a traditional progressive platform, and that includes um, fighting income inequality. Uh, 
and that will infuse a lot of my votes in Congress. That includes on Medicare for All, um, um, reforming uh, prescription, prescription costs uh, throughout, uh, throughout our medical system. And uh, these are mostly positions that most Democrats and even independents already agree on. Uh, vast majority of Democrats, 77% favor Medicare for All, and 55% in the last Kaiser Family Foundation um, poll had, in, had independents, 55% were for And then also when we look at uh, minimum wage, $15 minimum wage, broad support for that as well. So I'll be a very consistent vote for those issues, um, as well as, uh, and I don't think it's a, a progressive issue, but pushing for this campaign, pushing for this uh, constitutional amendment to reform our elections, that's going to be a big issue that I'm going to be running on once in Congress. Uh, I'm going to continue my pledge not to take money from PACs and corporations and outside of our district. They say that members of Congress spend 70% of their time once elected raising money for the next election. Well, all that time, I'm going to be putting into pushing for a nonpartisan constitutional amendment, and it has to be nonpartisan, or else there's gonna, if you put poison pills in it, it's not going to represent what most voters want, and we won't be able to put the pressure on the elected officials. Yeah, so uh, on a note that, that, that me and Buzz differ on and that we'll probably argue about for, for years, uh, I am not a Donald Trump supporter. Um, and so my, my candidate in this upcoming election, the one that I support, is Bernie Sanders. And even though I can't, I can't vote for him in this primary, I hope I can vote for him in the general. And I hope he wins. Um, he's an honest man who has lived an honest 40 years of, of civil service, and his record is consistent. He wants to fight for working class people. He wants to do what needs to be done in our country. Now, I don't agree with everything that Bernie thinks, and I'm sure if he read my 55,000 word platform that he wouldn't agree with everything in there either. What we want to focus on is those progressive ideas that, like Jeff said, have overwhelming support. When you poll people and over 70% of them say they like Medicare for all, or that the minimum wage should be $15 an hour, I, I feel like those are not leftist issues. Those are middle-of-the-road issues. And so it's, it's very easy for me to say that I support progressive policies that deal with our economy and deal with our lives. My, my platform is based on small business, lower taxes, legal immigration, and uh, criminal reform, which President Trump has actually started us on, on, on the path to having finally having some criminal reform. And California definitely needs that. Let's talk about small business for a second in the state. It, again, one of the reasons why a lot of businesses are leaving California, leaving our state. Currently in California, 98.9% .9 of all businesses are small business. They employ 4 million people in this state. When you start looking at the fact that they are being forced to leave now, for a variety of reasons, I'll get to the minimum wage here in a second. They're being forced to leave now. That is that is creating the class war we're talking about. It's the top one percent and, and the bottom ninety nine. It's the middle the middle class small business folks are being forced out of California, and that's affecting us all. It's creating homeless issues. It's creating tax issues. It's creating funding problems. The minimum wage um, increases. It sounds like a good idea, but I saw an article the other day in uh, Sacramento paper that talks about how many of the, of the restaurants in Sacramento are closing down because their, their profit margins gotten so small they can't afford to stay in business and pay that minimum wage. So we've got to, we've got to address this as, as um, caring about the people of California first and foremost. And the way to do that is finding a plan or a solution that works for all of us. Minimum wage is one aspect of it, but you cannot force the businesses to leave and go to Utah and Texas because of that. Well, one of the uh, big advantages of getting rid of the health, in, health insurance industry is that your employers and your employees don't have to pay for their health care that way any longer. They don't have to pay those big premiums where the increases in taxes for health care, single payer health care, are a fraction of what they're paying in the premiums and the co-pays. And, you know, this is a big shot in the arm for the whole economy, getting rid of the health insurance 
parasite. And that's one of the th problems that we're having uh, universally in our, our whole economy is that the health insurance industry is feeding off of our economy so badly that it's ruining us. And another thing is getting us out of these regime change wars. Um, gee, there's so many things that we could be doing with all that money. Four billion dollars a month in Afghanistan alone. You know, and think of all the social programs we could be doing with that money. And getting ourselves out of the problems that we're in. And helping to, to actually get, for instance, a, a reactivate the WPA so that we can put money into people's pockets. And then my final, my final question, across the country we're seeing cities ever growing and ever being overpopulated. How do you guys plan on combating rent control bills and overpopulated cities and people, college students, young people in their 20s living in four or five people in one small apartment? Were you asking how do we combat yeah. rent control? Yeah, combat rent control. Are you for it or against it? Uh, well, <laughs> like I think a lot of our problems with housing um, should be solved at the, the local level, at the state level. But as we have seen, the, the local level and the state level has not worked here in California. Um, so what what role can Congress play in, in alleviating the burden on cities, on ensuring that, that rents are reasonable for people? Uh, we have federal programs that uh, provide money for, for public housing, for, for building public housing, and for, for vouchers. Um, and I think those programs should be fully funded and expanded. Um, they have shown great success in their time, and I think we can do even better with that. As far as rent control goes, it's hard to imagine Congress passing a National Rent Control Act when the state of California can't do it. Um, would I support a, a rent control act if, if it could pass in Congress? I, I think I would. If enough of Congress, enough of the United States government thinks hey, these localities have not been doing their job and we need to step in with a stick that will put them in line. Sign me up. <laughs> I like bashing heads. I like holding sticks. <laughs> I do not mind saying that the super majority of Democrats in California are doing a terrible job. Well, I'll agree with that. The Democrats in California are not doing a good job. Um, and I, can, I think we can all agree the state's going in the wrong direction. In terms of affordable housing, I think California probably is the worst state in the country. In terms of that, I don't think rent control is the, is the answer. I rent. Uh, I think if we were to uh, enforce rent control, we'd have a lot less landlords renting in California, not more. Um, I think, again, I think it goes back to us empowering people to, uh, to have jobs, to have a, a livable income to have the families uh, going to decent schools for their children. Uh, and I think that, I know Gavin Newsom likes to talk about the fact that a lot of the homeless issue is affordable housing. I think a part, a part of that is true, but it's so much bigger in California than that. It's also mental health issues, it's addiction issues, it's, it's, a, a, it's a, a huge problem that California has not tackled yet. And I think the federal government might have to get involved with homelessness in the state. Uh, but I think, again, the, the bottom line is we empower people to want to be here. We empower small business to want to be here. We make it it's a, a better place to live. California used to be the great golden state, and people are leaving in droves. For the first time ever, California had more people leave this year than came into the state. We're going in the wrong direction. Well, the uh, interesting thing is, is that the Green New Deal, one of the interesting things about that is 20 million new jobs that pay well. And there's actually a, a budget that's been uh, worked out, uh, 2.6 uh, billion, uh, trillion, trillion, I'm sorry, trillion. Uh, but you know, we, we've spent over $6 trillion in the Middle East and Asia uh, since 2000. 
uh, six trillion. And what we get out of the, the Green New Deal is energy independence, we get single payer health care, increased education for our people, and 20 million new jobs. Uh, look up Howie Hawkins uh, for president. He, uh, he's, he's already worked out a budget, and uh, he's uh, really got a, a, a good thing going there. And that would 20 million jobs. It's not too bad. And uh, bringing back the WPA is a really good idea. That would get people back to working today and put money back in their pockets so that there's now a, a new economy. I'm in agreement that uh, uh, the problem with affordable housing is mostly a local and state issue. It's really hard at the federal level to have kind of a one-size-fits-all um, approach, even if it was an omnibus bill. But the federal role um, is to attack those issues that make it difficult for people to afford the housing. So we get at income inequality, we get at the minimum wage, we talk about how how much uh, the, the health and, uh, health costs can paralyze people and put them out of the ability to keep their home or rent. Then also we have the issue of student loans, which uh, is a much bigger issue and there's a, a, a lot more players that have involved with, with, with those runaway um, size of loans and costs of college. But that's the role where the federal government can play in attacking those other issues which are related to why people can't afford the housing. Um, and these are a lot of issues that most people agree on already. Um, now, difference of opinion on how you deal with student debt, but there should be little difference of opinion that the runaway cost of, of getting a college degree is not reflected in some sort of increased improvement in the degrees people are getting. There's some fundamental underlying reasons why our academic systems have seen increased costs. It used to be, at one, one thing I always found interesting long ago, it used to be if you wanted to create a new building on campus, you have one of those thermometers and you pay for that building once you get to the top of the thermometer. Now it's all bonds and all those extra costs go to students. Thank you. Good job. Good questions. Thank you, Senator. Okay, so now we're going to start with Buzz Patterson, and the next question is, what role should the federal government have in women's reproductive health? I get the good one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think that there's no way that Roe v. Wade is the law of the land, and I don't ever see that being overturned. I'm saying that as a pro-life uh, person and as Christian, uh, but I don't think we ever overturn that. I'm not sure we want the federal government uh, to do much more than that. Um, I think we have a law in place that protects women's right to choose. Uh, I'm married to a woman, uh, so I, I understand her, her perspective on that as well. Uh, and I will, I'm talking about, all we've been talking tonight a lot about has been federal programs, and I'm, I'm of the mind that we don't need more government involved in our day-to-day -day lives, we need less government involved. Uh, I've been a part of government, I've seen it in the military, I've seen it from the White House perspective, and government tends to um, overreach and underproduce, underdeliver. Uh, so I think where we are right now with Roe v. Wade is fine, uh, and I think that women uh, are, are well accommodated with that. I don't think they need to, we need to have any more government involvement and women's right to choose. Well, I am pro-choice. I definitely think that a whole bunch of white men should not be making decisions for white, even colored women or white women, you know, any color of women. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a woman's choice. And she's going to be saddled with that child for the next 18 years or so. And she knows what she's getting into. But being forced into it, that's not a really good way of going at it. 
Uh, I want children to be wanted, not forced on people. And that's the problem. We end up with a lot of very unstable young people when you force they're growing up on, on a mother that doesn't really want them or, or can really handle them. And, you know, it used to be that you had 10 children so that you'd have enough people to, to run the farm and that you'd have these people to, to take care of you when you got, got older. And, you know, you had 10 so that two of them would survive. You know, but in industrial life, it's, it changes. You have, you get down to just a replacement strategy. Thank you very much. Well, this is a clear cut issue for me. I'm pro choice for a woman's right to choose, for her control over her own body. And uh, most Americans know their issue where 67% of Americans are not in favor of, of uh, reducing those rights. And uh, it's one of these issues that's always interesting when you think about it from the pers perspective of people who want less government in our life. But this is one of those contradictions for those people who want less government in our life. But here we see across the country, in Missouri, in other states, where the government is intruding and creating uh, barriers to um, um, the, same, the same rights to choose by women. Uh, that's enjoyed in other states. And uh, uh, there's just been a, a chiseling back against Roe v. Wade over the years that unfortunately needs to be stopped. And uh, um, the only way to do it is to continually to have more pro-choice candidates in office who will be that bulwark. And hopefully over time, uh, we're able to change the Supreme Court so that we don't have these small chiseling back of rights. And we go back to just a pure principle of pro-choice and a woman's right to choose. Well, I am, I'm pro-blood transfusion, I'm pro-heart transplant, and I am pro-abortion. Maybe that's something that a millennial can say that the, the, the other pro-choice candidates can't, um, is that I, I'm not squirming about abortion. <clears throat> it is a right, just like any other medical care. And so I, I think first we need to repeal the Hyde Amendment that stops any federal funding from going to abortions. We also need to put Roe v. Wade, the result saying that states cannot restrict abortion rights, we need to put that into federal law. We need to pass that statute. We need to get it on the books. We shouldn't have to worry about the Supreme Court changing its mind because we know the Supreme Court and they're ready to change their mind. Um, Along with, with uh, you know, caring about women's rights and caring about, uh, you know, sexual freedom, family planning, I also care about religious freedom. But religious freedom does not mean injuring other people and saying that my religion allows me to do that. Religious freedom is about everyone being treated the same and everyone following a law. And I don't think hospitals should deny care to people just because their board members are of a certain religion. I, I find that completely terrible in a secular democracy that we have such a problem with hospitals denying care. Next question. And I must say, uh, we have a lot of questions here, a lot of good questions. And so I really appreciate you uh, not taking the whole minute and a half if you don't need to, because <laughs> that's how we get to more questions. So I'm not going to cut it down to a minute yet, because you're, you're really cooperating so well, and I think you're able to, to make your points uh, within that time. So now, for Chris, you're first. As a member of Congress, how will you, one, <laughs> protect public lands, and two, restore full funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, well, the um, government was originally funded by the sale of public lands, and, uh, gee, this is... Uh, 
it is something that we need to, to uh, keep in mind is that our, our uh, reserve lands need to be protected and we are not being very protective of them with all the fracking and the storing uranium, you know, refuse under uh, some of our, our tribal lands and uh, boy, that is, that's really a tough one. But uh, we do need to uh, be funding that because that is our legacy for the future for our, our, our children and uh, how the world that they're going to, to grow up in and, and uh, occupy. Well, I am a conservationist. I am an environmentalist. My first job out of college was in Washington, D.C., working for the National Wildlife Federation in their grassroots department. And, uh, uh, when it comes to this issue of fully funding, I mean, there always can be ways to find that money. Now we do get into a bigger issue in terms of um, um, our overall budget and our deficits, but the money money is there to take from other things if we just want to do a zero sum. But a more a more foundational issue as it relates to our public lands is the need for a revisiting of our fair use um, rules of our public. Uh, domain. The fair use uh, uh, rules is supposed to allow equal access for all groups and all purposes to our lands. Um, however, we need to make a priority, not in terms of choosing who gets to use those lands in recreational ways, but in terms of commercial ways. I think we need to change the fair use laws to de-emphasize pure commercial uses of our lands, not to get rid of it completely, but it shouldn't be equal to, because once it's equal to, those commercial interests are the only ones with financial means to really put pressure on our political systems to get everything they want. And then, you know, then we have the strip mining, the fracking, and that affects all of us, and that's not, that's not fair use, that's spreading all of the ills among all of us. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned uh, Teddy Roosevelt in my opening, and it, there's really, um, even in the, 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 the California Republican Party platform, we are conservationists. We believe that we are stewards of the environment and we care about it. Now where I might disagree with some other Republicans is, you know, what, what can we do um, about, you know, mining for resources, what can we do about oil extraction? But a lot of Californians, they want to protect the coastline. They want to protect our, our forests and our mountains. We are not in great opposition on this point. And so really what we have to look at is the status quo and really if somebody starts talking about we need to, to open up the parks and get at that oil or something like that, we, we need to say, hey, slow down a little. Let's talk about this. That's a good amount of time. Uh, this is going to be short and sweet, Paul. You're going to love this. I'm a camper. I'm a skier. I'm a hiker. I love our parks. I have no problem with federal protection of our parks and our lands. I think it's an awesome idea. Thank you. In fact, I, I think it, I saw we have more questions, so maybe one minute. Can you guys go to one minute and give me the 30 seconds uh, after 30 seconds? I think you can do it. And if it's, if it's a question that needs more time, just ask for it, okay? Okay, so we're going to start with Jeff this time. And the question is, do you believe the Equal Rights Amendment should now take effect now that Virginia has been the last state to ratify it after all these years? I added that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I looked into this issue a few years ago as I was researching my own constitutional amendment on election reform, and uh, uh, while I'm for the IRA, I fought the, the, uh, the law that allowed it to be ratified by states, um, had a sunset provision, first for I think it was six years, and then they extended it for another four years, um, and so I'm not sure how, how we get around that, um, and I've watched the reporting in, in the news, and, 
And sometimes I wonder, did, did I do my research correctly? Because they seem to forget that, and then they say, oh, it should be you know, now law because of Virginia. As, as unfortunate it is to me that, that, uh, um, that we have that sunset provision, it seems like we probably need to do a new constitutional amendment on that. Um, uh, but all in favor of equal rights, equal pay, um, all across the board. Yeah, it's such a, a technically specific question on constitutional law. Um, is is so we we passed equal rights amendment, the acts in Congress. It had a sunset provision added to it, but states ratified and ratified and ratified, and some states took it back. And so a question we have is: Well, can states take it back? Does the sunset sunset provision apply? But a real, more fundamental question is, do women have equal rights in America? And should they? And the answer is yes. And so I, I hope that if it makes it to the Supreme Court or any court, that it's upheld as, as, as the law of the land. That there is no reason why technicalities should stop something that a majority of states and a majority of people agree with. 100% agree. It should be ratified, and the states that uh, backed out due to the sunset provision should be forced to to uh, readdress going forward. Definitely, we need to support the Equal Rights Amendment. There's no question about that. It uh, it's unfortunate that it has a sunset clause in it. That's, uh, it's unusual in that. Uh, there's an awful lot of bills that should have them that don't have them. Uh, but uh, I believe that uh, equal rights for equal pay, and, and there's nothing to, to argue about that. Thank you very much. Okay, this question for John. If you had been a member of the House last month, yes. would... Would you have voted to impeach President Trump? Um, I, I would have. Um, the, the evidence that I have seen is clear and convincing. Um, we do not elect a king in our country. We elect a president. And I'm hopeful but not very optimistic about how the Senate will, will conduct this trial. Um, but really there comes a point where even with all the president's men standing behind him, you, you need to really look at the evidence, look at the facts and think for yourself. I was actually working for President Clinton, uh, when he was impeached in 1998 and I didn't agree with it then and I don't agree with it now. I think it creates a horrible precedent, uh, that we... Uh, for partisan purposes, allow one party to attempt to override and overrule a duly elected president. Um, I also think if this is pushed through for President Trump, it creates a very slippery slope for the next Democratic president that, that occupies the White House because what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and you're going to see the Republicans going after the Democratic president next time if we're allowed to, if we if we allow this to go forward. So I would not have voted. In fact, I'm embarrassed that he would not vote for it unless it was partisan, bipartisan, and of course he voted for it. It was not bipartisan. So uh, he's talking out of his, of his mouth as well. So the answer I would give you is no. It was it good for Clinton? It's not good for Trump. It's not good for the country. We're uh, impeaching him on the wrong thing. We should be impeaching him on the emoluments clause. Uh, he did not protect his properties by Could you explain that for, for those that don't know what the emoluments clause Okay, is. the emoluments, emoluments clause is that a president or a person in office should not profit from their positions or you know, sell their position, uh, basically, uh, for profit. And so uh, by not uh, divesting himself of his holdings, they are all subject to being confiscated. <coughs> and they should. Uh, well, I would have voted for impeachment a month ago. I had read the Mueller report, and after reading that, I thought there was a basis to impeach him based on 
the tampering with witnesses and the obstruction of justice. I thought that those uh, actions were severe and not from the perspective of being a partisan. I've always taken the perspective on, on impeachment from a principled perspective. I feel like what's forgotten most in this situation, it's almost like in a court case where there's one side, there's the other, but the real victim is our democracy. It's our system. It's us as voters as well. And if you take a principled, good steward of government um, approach, it's not acceptable what he did just in the Mueller report. And then since then with Ukraine, we have to protect our democracy. And uh, any obfuscation of that is not acceptable. Um, and anyone who tries to introduce gamesmanship, political gamesmanship of how this helps the Democrats or helps Trump, that misses the fundamental issue and the principles involved. Okay, Buzz Patterson. Should we build the wall on the southern border with money that was designated for the military? Uh, Hopefully, we won't have to do that with the military funds going forward, but I am 100% behind border security in one form or another, whether it's a wall, whether it's uh, electric sensors, whether it's uh, drones. Uh, we are, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, we allowed immigrants to come to this country for many reasons, but we, but we, needed, we needed the workforce. Uh, and since then, we have become, and I think we're seeing it play out in California's uh, economy these days, and it's become a national security issue. I think it's one of our foremost national security issues that we, uh, we cannot uh, determine who's coming across the border illegally. I'm all for legal immigration. Uh, I encourage legal immigration. But I think that as a sovereign nation, you have to have the ability to control who comes into your country and leaves your country, just like every other sovereign country in this world does, including Mexico and Canada. We're the only one that doesn't do that, and I, I enforce, I, I support the wall, whether it's electronic, drones, or a physical structure. The DOB should not be paid for it, no. Ah. Well, we need to be building more bridges than walls. We need to uh, take a look at who it is that's coming to our borders. A lot of times, we've run them out of their own countries. Those people that are coming to our borders have been run out of their, their countries in Central and South America. And they're trying to, they're, <laughs> they're knocking at the door of the people that have abused them. And so we get to abuse them a second time. Isn't that wonderful? So, we, you know, immigration has always been a, a cultural in, increase by bringing new ideas into the, the economy and new ways of doing business. Uh, this is incredibly valuable if we do it right. And we've got to do it. Thank you. Well, the, the wall, of course, was just a symbolic gimmick. It's not something that's necessarily effective. It's just a splinter symbol. And, uh, and, it, and it obscures a lot of the uh, more uh, um, important issues that's going on at our border. When you think about the border um, detention camps and the conditions there, that's more important than the money that's wasted on a border wall that's not really needed. Um, but those conditions in those camps, that's a real issue that, that requires much more attention. And one thing that I have been disappointed uh, with my opponent, Ami Berra, is when it came to those border detention camps, there was back in June last year, there was a vote on a Democratic bill, an emergency bill, to bring funding and higher accountability on our border to those camps. And his uh, caucus, the Problem Solvers Caucus, uh, had basically thrown all of their support behind the Republican bill instead of letting the Democratic bill pass and go to a conference committee where we could have negotiated for stronger accountability. That's the bigger issue that strikes me, is not just the wall, but what would be on our side of the wall that's going on right now. All right, so uh, first, I don't think that we should build a wall along the southern border. Um, people know how airplanes work. Uh, ladders, pebbles. Um, it's a ridiculous idea. It's a child's idea of security. Um, secondly, we don't need security. It's, it's, that's 
the people that are walking here are walking here from far away with no money to be able to, to, to get a visa or a job or anything like that. And they're people who need our help. Um, workers coming here, we're, we're facing a labor shortage right now. We have an aging population. Uh, we're coming out of a recession and we're still talking about isolationism as if we are in a recession. We're not. We have jobs. We have one of the lowest unemployment rates that I, I've lived through. Um, we need workers. On the budget thing, uh, should we use DOD funds that aren't appropriated for something else? No, I think Congress should have the role, the power of the purse. Chris is first. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, put these two questions together. It's basically about uh, it's an environmental climate change question. Do you believe that climate change is real and caused by human activity? <coughs> and what is your take on prioritizing renewable and sustainable energy? Which oh, would be which would yes. be one of the solutions? Well. To Yes, it is very real. I have actually seen the uh, snowpacks uh, melt in Alaska and uh, also noticed that the permafrost is melting and that's going to increase the influx of CO2 into the atmosphere. And uh, we, we have met the enemy and they is us. We are the ones who are doing it and sustainable energy is the way we need to do it. And the Green New Deal is a way to, to actually accomplish that in a, uh, an ongoing, sustainable way. And part of that is going to be the <coughs> revision of the internal combustion engine in cars into electric cars. Now, being able to convert them, it, that's a whole new industry whole bunch of new people are going to be able to find jobs just taking care of converting cars. Shorter the better on the answers, everybody. I can get every question. Well, I'm a big proponent of the Green New Deal. Uh, we do have an environmental emergency. It has to be addressed. And it needs people in Congress who are for not just talk, but real climate action. And uh, this is one of the fundamental differences between my fellow Democrat and Ami Berra. Uh, you hear him talk on the issue and he says that on the one hand, he's in favor of the ideals of the Green New Deal, but he can't support it because it's only aspirational. So he's for the aspirations, but against the aspirations. It makes no sense. He also sits on a committee where he's vice chair of science, space, and technology, and can be introducing bills. Uh, he says he's for doing uh, governmental uh, stimulus, incentives to find ways to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. He says this is urgent. He sits on a committee and he's never submitted that bill. He's the vice chair. So we need people in Congress who believe that this is urgent and will be climate action and not just words. Yeah, I, I find it ridiculous to debate the idea of whether or not there is human caused climate change. There obviously is should be obvious to everyone, and that should not be a debate. I support the Green New Deal. Um, obviously, I, it, it upsets me that we have waited this long to have a debate over what to do. Thank you. Uh, it's obvious, I'll agree, it's obvious that uh, humans are causing uh, climate change in this country and around the world, actually. In fact, China and India are the, are the worst um, the worst uh, criminals when it comes to environmental change. I, I think the new Green New Deal, as, as pie in the sky as it sounds, is completely untenable right now, economically. I think it would bankrupt the nation, for example. You're not going to be able to ground every airplane in the sky. That would, that would destroy business, would destroy airlines, would destroy the economy. I think we should be studying how to go forward with renewable energy. I, I'm a big proponent of that as well, but the Green New Deal is a little bit too of a, too much of a unicorn for me to buy at this point in time, I think it would crush the country. Okay, Jeff. Do you support the current system for electing the president, or would you support the national popular vote for president? 
I'm, I'm in favor of the national popular vote. Um, the problem, though, by passing it as a constitutional amendment, which would be the only way to do it, you get into one of these issues where would you get the other side, the other partisans to be in favor of it? So unfortunately, it seems a long shot because uh, you have one, one, one party that thinks the current system favors it and another party who desperately wants it changed. And so as much as I'd like to change it, it can't happen. Um, and I've been studying a lot about uh, constitutional amendments because obviously I'm for campaign finance reform, election reform. Um, my feeling though is if we pass something like my election reform amendment, it gets a gerrymandering, campaign finance reform, and in corporate personhood, we would level the playing field, not just at the presidential level, but for all candidates. Uh, you'd probably take out about 80% of the cost of running for uh, for office from local, state, uh, not local, but federal, like our positions uh, and state positions. And that would allow much more stewards of good government to run and not just telemarketers. I feel like this is such a cool, nerdy elections thing that everybody knows about now. The Electoral College should be abolished. We should go to a popular vote. It's kind of one of the tenets of democracy is that the majority should win. Um, and uh, I, I don't think that we're going to get there through a constitutional amendment, but we might get there um, through the compact that states are now taking um, that, that I believe California is a part of. Yes. To, uh, to, uh, to agree that if we get enough um, of the states to get on board, then we will just switch to a popular vote by, by um, pooling whoever, uh, whoever wins the election. We'll just, we'll just, send all our electoral college people for them. The problem with all these arguments is that we're not a democracy, we're a republic. And the founding fathers knew that 217, 220 years ago. And if we were to go to a popular vote, it would be LA, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, deciding every single election. And that's, that's untenable for a republic. We have 50 states, we, we vote based on the electoral college. It's been that way, it'll always be that way. There's no way, as, as Jeff pointed out, it'll ever, be, it'll ever pass a, a, an amendment. And it all depends on what side of the dial you're on, right? If you're a Democrat, you want New York and LA to study every single election. If you're a Republican, you're saying, I want the Republic of a Republic. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, the only reason why it's a big deal now is because Hillary lost. That's the only reason why we're talking about it. Okay, faster, faster. <laughs> <laughs> the Electoral College should be abolished. There's no question about it. It's a holdover from slavery days when you wanted to, to increase the power of the slave owner. We don't need it any longer. Supposedly, you know, we, we have democracy in this country. It, I think it's a really good idea. I wish we had it. We don't. We've got a duopoly. We have two parties that are trading back and forth and it's not doing us very much good. Ranked choice voting is the way to go. There, there is no primary. There's only the general election, and all the candidates are on that ballot. You go, you go your first, second, third, and fourth choice for each seat, and if your first choice doesn't make it, your second choice gets your vote. What a concept. Wow. Democracy. Good idea. Okay, John, um, can you guys go to 30 seconds? Because I just... I would hate to miss out on some of these great questions. <laughs> I keep to like three we really, we want to, we want to finish at seven thirty or very close to it. Um, what do you think about? What do you think about um, uh, free college? I thought this might be of interest to uh, this. Group. I am, I am absolutely for it. Uh, expanding, making high school free was one of the best things this country has done, and obviously making free college uh, a reality for all Americans will will improve our country. Yeah, that's great. Totally opposed. If everybody that's ever paid for a student loan or gone to college, we get our money back. We're making it free. How how do we afford that? Who if we're gonna buy the if we're gonna pay for the Green New Deal and free college, who's gonna be paying for this stuff? I'm sure that I'm not gonna ante up somebody else's kid to go to school. I've got three going to school right now. Education is an investment in the future. If we don't invest in the future, we're dead already. And we've got to do this. I I had two areas of study, biology and computers. And I was, the two of them together made for a, a, a dynamite combination. And we need to have 
education as a lifelong effort for the person to help expand their, their abilities. Okay, Jeff. Um, uh, well, I'm, oh, yeah. yeah. You have to. Uh, well, the principal's right about free public colleges and universities. Uh, there's no reason why in our modern uh, age where you do need a college degree in so many fields that it shouldn't just be K through 12, but K through 16. Now, the one thing I'm always looking at is how you pay for it. And when I see all the different programs out there, even though I'm a progressive, I haven't just yet seen exactly how you pay for it all, all of the different issues that are out there, as well as reduce our, our federal deficit, which is $1.1 trillion per year that we're adding. So that would be my only caveat. I'd like to see exactly how you pay for all of these things. Okay, I'm, I'm just not going to get to all the questions and end on time. So I'm going to let you know what the questions are so those who ask the questions may come up and discuss it with you afterwards. But just to, to for respecting people's time, um, we're going to um, move on a little bit here. So um, we're going to go to closing statements, and we're going to reverse the order. So we are going to begin with Dr. Chris Richardson. OK. Well, uh, there are a great many changes that need to be made, and I want to be at the head of doing that. There, I have a number of position papers on my website. Please bring them down and take a look at them. Uh, ranked choice voting is a great way of getting democracy back into our vote. Uh, also, we're, we're more than happy to have, you know, corporate socialism and bail out the banks, but we cannot bail out our students. We put them into slavery and then we expect them to pay for it. Uh, I'm sorry, but it, it's a, an investment in the future. If you don't invest, we've we got problems. I want to thank uh, the League of Women Voters for having us, Paula. This has been a lot of fun, and I also want to uh, applaud everybody up here because uh, currently in this country there's far too, dissent, too much dissension and far too much polarization, and I think it's great to be in, a, in an environment where we're all having a good time telling you uh, what our beliefs are, what our, what our platforms are. I wish that the people in Washington, D.C. Could, could be doing much more of the same that you're seeing here today, and I hope when I'm elected to defeat Ami Barrett, that I'll be able to take some some civil decorum uh, to Washington D.C. and get us get this nation back on track, where we can actually come together and compromise. Yeah, thanks, folks. Uh, I, I I you know applaud every everybody else up here. Um, this has been a fun experience for me running. I, I I think you should all consider at some point in your life. Um, either running yourself or supporting a campaign. Um, while you're here, you should you should pick one of us as your favorite, and you should go get flyers from us. <laughs> and and don't forget to vote on March third, yes. March third or before. <laughs> I think the ballots are going out soon. Um, but you should go and you should talk to your neighbors. And you don't have to try and convince them of something, but you do need to go knock on their door and say, "Hey, I've never met you or I haven't seen you in years." and go, hey, there's an election coming up. How are you? What do you need? What should we be doing as a community to get organized and to figure out what we want our politicians to do? This room could have been full today. Yes, it could have been. There's a district of 700,000 people, about 400,000 voters. This room could have been full today. Well, um, in life, sometimes we have to make choices between our head and our hearts. Um, but in this primary, in my opinion, this is not one of those times. Um, my candidacy is actually providing a very clear-cut choice on both principles and policy. That's because our district is now solidly Democratic, and I'm the only Democrat in this race who is working on solidly Democratic positions related to Medicare for All, comprehensive drug cost reform, the New Deal, and taking no corporate or PAC money. But if you feel you still don't know enough about me, I have a solution. It's vote for me in the primary and give you yourself nine more months 
to compare me side by side with Ami Bera, and then I think your head and, the, and your heart will come to an agreement that I'm the right Democrat with the right principles to represent this district. Thank you, candidates. Thank you for running for office and being willing to be a part of this republic. And thank you very much. Before we leave, though, we have a couple of announcements because we're counting on, on you here tonight to help spread the word to other potential voters as we approach the March 3rd election. This is really important. If you are a no party preference voter, which there are many in California now, and you want to vote for president, you will need to request a special ballot. The uh, parties that you can vote for president in are the Democratic Party, the American Independent Party, or the Libertarian Party. Again, if you are a no party preference voter, you will not see an opportunity on the ballot to vote for president. And so you need to get a new ballot. And that's easy to do. Check your registration status is another important thing. You can find out how you're registered. If you don't know, if you can't remember, uh, I have a website here, voterstatus.sos.ca.gov. I said that very fast, so come up if you would like to hear it again, and I'll give it to you. If you're not registered now, or you have moved and you have a new address, or maybe you even have a new signature, you've changed how you sign your name, maybe you have to change your party, those are all reasons to re-register to vote, and you can do it tonight outside at our table. I also wanted to remind you that the ballots are going to be coming out very soon, and every registered voter in Sacramento will get a mailed ballot. We don't use polling places anymore. You, there's three ways that you can vote. You can sign the ballot, very important, a lot of people forget to sign it, and mail it. And the postage is free now. It wasn't last time. You can drop it in a drop box located at every county library in the, in the county. And it doesn't matter where you live. Most failures. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's other places, but libraries, everything yeah, knows where they are. Um, you can vote in person at a full-service vote center, and at one of those vote centers, you can replace your ballot. You can register the vote even on the last day. You can get information in various languages, and you can find uh, accessible voting equipment at vote centers. So after you close the forum, I have a few words of appreciation Heartfelt, thank you to you all for running for office, as I said. And I really want to thank Rio Americano and Nina Seibel. Where is she? No comment. Oh, she's out there. <laughs> Nina. Yeah. They want to thank you, Ken. Because um, Nina and the students, we are very grateful to you for uh, providing us the opportunity to have the forum here, and thank you for helping us um, run the forum. And I want to thank the League of Women Voters volunteers, the timer, the questions for all the people out there. And thank you. Bye.